This is a great example of a concise, well-pled complaint, in my humble opinion. This is Curtis Bruner versus Burger King Corporation. This is in the state of Oregon. I have never heard of this county before. Multnomah County? I'm not sure if that's Portland or, or what, but it says here that Mr. Bruner, on the afternoon of Saturday, December 15th, 2018, when we got our Silver Play Award, yes. Mr. Bruner visited his local, local Portland area Burger King located at 2555 Northeast 238 Drive. So you can even find out which one they're talking about. Mr. Bruner ordered a meal, paid for his food, took a seat. After Mr. Bruner finished his meal, he walked into Burger King's bathroom. Mr. Bruner used the bathroom, washed his hands, and walked towards the door to leave. Very important that everybody know he washed his hands. It's very important. Yes. When Mr. <laughs> Bruner pulled on the door handle to leave the bathroom, the door would not open. After repeatedly pulling hard on the door handle without success, Mr. Bruno took out his phone and he called the Burger King number listed on his receipt. The employees repeatedly tried pushing on the bathroom door but were unable to open it. Burger King employees eventually slid a fly swatter under the bathroom door and told Mr. Bruner to try and pry the bathroom door lock open. Despite eventually cutting his hand, attempting to use the fly swatter on the lock, the bathroom door would not open. Mr. Bruner could hear Burger King employees and customers laughing while he remained locked inside in its bathroom for well over an hour before a locksmith finally came and broke him out. Burger King provided Mr. Bruner a band-aid and ointment for the cut on his hand and offered to settle the matter in exchange for a lifetime supply of Burger King meals at no cost. Also, I for once now finally saw a reason to keep the receipts. Yeah. Because normally when they're like, would you like a receipt? And I'm like, I just bought some chips. Like, I don't think I'm going to return Yeah, you get this. locked in the Tesco bathroom. How are you going to figure out what number to call? It's not like we have uh, mobile computers in our pockets at all times. Hey, he's pretty lucky that he was, or he would have been stuck in there oh. possibly longer. Plus the bigger brands, they normally just have the headquarters. So you first need to phone the headquarters number to then forward you to the local branch. Yeah, you can't. A lot of times you can't even get a hold of a local branch of anything. Um, when I bought this computer that I'm literally streaming on, they promised me and assured me that support would be easy to get and I would have no problem, just call a phone number. Well, of course, there was a problem not with the computer, not with anything technical, but there was a problem with my actual Microsoft account. Over the years, Microsoft has like converted the systems or something, and I ended up having like three Microsoft accounts under different email addresses, but that they were all the same account, and it wouldn't let me reconcile them. And of course, their phone system has no option for that, so their phone system wouldn't let me talk to anybody. Since I couldn't correctly categorize my problem, they wouldn't let me talk to anybody. So I literally had to call, well, when I called the store number, it literally forwarded me back to the same support system that wouldn't give me to anybody. So I finally was like, okay, well, I'll get to somebody by hitting one of the numbers that doesn't apply and then explaining that I need to talk to the store. And then they wouldn't let me talk to the store. So I basically had to threaten to return the thing on the very same day that I bought it which was going to be another hour and a half drive for me away because they wouldn't let me get to a person. And so I did, I did call somebody who, or did finally get to a tech support person who was like, okay, 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 I'll, I'll, I'll send you to the store. And then the store was like, okay, 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 you will let you talk to the associate. And then they, they were like, okay, we're sorry that we promised you you'd have support and then gave you this horrible runaround. Here, let me just click a button here and look, your Microsoft account is fixed, it's all done. It was literally like half an hour of effort of me just trying to get to somebody to do literally one click of a mouse on something they had a lot of control over. Wouldn't it have saved everybody a lot of hassle? I mean, I'm never going to buy a Microsoft laptop again without doing the thing in the store where I go, okay, what's the phone number? Oh, look, I haven't reached somebody yet. Yeah, take $100 off the laptop, please. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you lied to me. So after the incident, described in this complaint, Burger King offered to settle with Mr. Bruner in exchange for a lifetime supply of Burger King meals at no cost. Mr. Bruner accepted Burger King's offer, and initially they uh, provided the meals at no cost. But then Burger King reneged and told Mr. Bruner that it no longer intended to honor the agreement. Mr. Bruner seeks a court order for specific performance requiring Burger King to resume providing him a lifetime supply of meals at no cost as agreed. Mr. Bruner is 50 years old, as uh, a Burger King Whopper meal costs about $7.89, a 
assuming that Mr. Bruner lives to be 72 years old and consumes on average one Burger King Whopper meal per week for the rest of his life, the value of Burger King's agreement with Mr. Bruner is $9,226.16. If the court will not require Burger King's specific performance under the agreement, Mr. Bruner instead requests judgment for the $9,000 against Burger King, which is the value of the lifetime supply of Burger King meals that he was promised. Now, I would like to take a moment and point out how honorable Mr. Bruner's request appears to be. Yeah. Yeah. They agreed to a lifetime supply, and he's saying once a week for 22 years is fine. Yeah. That's, that's, super that's limited. pretty honorable. Like, he yeah. could have probably argued once a day for 22 years. Once a day for 50 years. Like, I yeah. could be 100 years old. Like, well, probably not if you eat a Burger King meal every single day. But Yeah, that's yeah, the other a... point, is that, there, you know, I'd come back and say, well, you're not supposed to eat a Burger King meal every day, but... I don't care. That wasn't the agreement. <laughs> he has the choice. He has the choice. And yeah, and if you if you eat a Burger King meal every day, yeah, you're definitely going to be shortening your lifespan. Real, real quick, my doctor told me to cut down on the McDonald's, and so I eat at Chipotle now, and I make myself, you know, bur- burritos at home and stuff with chicken and rice. And my cholesterol has gone down, and my doctor said I was so healthy I didn't have to see him for two years, and everything's great. Now, now my trouble is I need to cut down on the sugar, but um, you've done well on that. I've been I've been doing well. I just don't know. I might I might have to go a lot farther. The you're in the daily... Scottish rehab right now. <laughs> oh, literally, yeah. I literally cut down on my sugar before I came here, so that I wouldn't be in such shock when things tasted different because there's no salt and no sugar in anything over here. Very little salt and and no sugar um i mean there is sugar but there's a sugar tax and stuff and so so these are these are just as expensive over here as they are in the states about two dollars well actually no this is about two dollars a bottle over here probably because of the um also this is a great example of pleading in the alternative if the court will not require burger king's specific performance because if you if you did both things if you said i want the meals and the money the, that would actually there would be a preliminary objection that, that that the opposing side could bring and say, hey, you're not allowed a double remedy. And like, no, 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 I meant it in the alternative. Well, this is pleading it in the alternative to overcome that objection before you even get there. Uh, also, this complaint is only six pages long, and notice that they have not repeated anything except this one sentence at the beginning of the breach of the agreement section. This is a great example of a concise, well pled complaint, in my humble opinion. So then they also plead negligence. In the alternative, if Burger King refuses to honor its agreement with Mr. Bruner, or if Burger King's attorneys later argue that no legally enforceable agreement was reached, now why would that be? Uh, Then Mr. Bruner intends to seek compensation for his injuries. So what does that mean that the attorneys might argue that no agreement was reached? There's actually a really, really good legal basis for this statement. First, does do the employees of a specific Burger King branch really have the authority to say we're going to settle a legal claim with you? Yeah. Do they have the authority to say we'll give you a free meal a week for life? Yeah. Isn't it maybe 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 the Burger King manager? Yeah. But that means he will have a free meal Me- with that manager until that manager leaves the job. Right. And then maybe the Burger King owner. Okay, maybe like that franchise branch's owner. Because, you know, it's it's a franchise. It's owned or, or operated uh, in some way by Burger King, the company, you know, or up to their standards under a franchise agreement. But usually, unless it's a store owned, uh, a Burger King owned store, it is owned by a franchisee who has, yeah. through their profits, paid for the right to be a Burger King owner. That would constitute an agreement with that franchise and that franchise only. Sure. Which is its own entity. So So then what if this guy wants to go get a Burger King meal, you know, free for life somewhere else? Well, that that's going to be tough to enforce. So, yeah, I could see that. But honestly, there's one there's one more thing in the U.S. law that we have almost never covered on this channel that prevents this from being a real agreement. And that's the statute of frauds. It, we, so you've heard about the statute of limitations, yeah. the law that says when a claim expires, two years for uh, in, a personal tort or intentional tort, four years for contract, 
these numbers are not everywhere. These are I'm quoting my Pennsylvania numbers, and I'm only quoting the last time I looked, so it could actually be updated. Um, uh, for example, the one that we talk about a lot, and I have to be careful about demonetization here, but certain kinds of crimes against the person that are very personal in nature, that I can't even say the word because we get demonetized for just saying it, um, those had statute of limitations that were long but still short enough that a perpetrator could get away with it, that a, that a victim might not realize how much of a victim they were and they didn't sue or, or, or charge for many years. Sometimes that happened. The statute of limitations sets that. But then there's another law. There's the statute of frauds. It says some very basic things have to happen before an agreement is reached. And it isn't for all agreements. And it isn't... Um, so yeah, it really, really what I mean to say is it only covers certain types of agreements. Agreements for large amounts of money, over $500, pretty much anywhere needs to be in writing. Now, your state will have their own statute of frauds. It's a state-to-state -state thing, but I'm going to quote some general numbers. That something over $500 has to be in writing. There might have to be certain requirements in order to have uh, certain agreements enforceable. Maybe an agree agreement for the transfer of property has to take a certain form or something like that. So you can't just go make an agreement for a lifetime supply of burgers on a handshake. You can start the agreement process with a handshake, and maybe the handshake is enforceable, but to have it be a fully completed agreement, it has to have been put into writing and signed. And then there's this other part, which is the, uh, the agency law or, or the corporate business law, corporate forms law, agency law. Who is allowed to bind a company to an agreement? Can a lowly Target or Walmart or Tesco employee bind you to, bind the whole company to a free meals for life at their establishment or Burger King or McDonald's or whoever? Yeah. Can, can really any lowly employee say, oh, okay, well, you know, you can come in. No, because that employee could go give meals to their, all their friends. The company would be bound. And, you know, then the company would have to go after a lowly employee for damages. And who knows how that would work out. No, it's not how that works. You must have the correct agency. Um, and I don't mean like a travel agent. I don't mean like a lawyer agent. I mean, you have to have the, you have to be the right person in the right position, showing the right amount of authority. So this is actual authority, apparent authority. These are agency laws. So you can't make this kind of binding legal agreement unless you are in the right amount of authority and agency. If you, the consumer, are trying to bind one of these companies, you have to show that the person you spoke to or dealt with or whatever had the authority, actual authority, or apparent authority. And that would be an argument that they told you that they were the right person, you thought you had all the reasons to believe that they were the right person, they did all the right things to make you believe that they were the right person. Something somewhere along the line you cross the threshold into, it's now, um, it's now enough that they are the corporate agent able to bind the company. So all of those arguments invalidate this agreement with Mr. Bruner and Burger King. So does that mean that Mr. Bruner loses his case? No. Mr. Bruner was locked in a bathroom for an hour, laughed at, and they handled it frankly negligently, in my humble opinion. They asked him to unlock the door himself using a tool that was not meant to unlock doors. Um, yeah, Leonard French would be perfectly fine trying to unlock the door with a fly swatter. I'm a locksmith, uh, or should I say I'm a certified locksmith? I don't, I don't, I don't work in the locksmith profession. But believe it or not, at 16 years old, I completed the Foley Bell Saw locksmithing certification and advanced locksmithing certification. So I am literally a certified locksmith, and I love watching the lock picking lawyer on YouTube, one of my favorite channels. I love watching the videos about penetration testers both from a technological standpoint and from a physical penetration standpoint, uh, how, they, you know, how they're able to stop laughing and how they're able to unlock 
you know, various doors. You know, the one about a spray can, uh, you know, triggering the exit sensor using the an upside down bottle of, 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 of air spray or whatever, is enough to cause the sensor to unlock the door and let you in. And this is a huge security vulnerability. Um, you can see the locksmithing lawyer's latest video. I don't know if it's his latest now, but it was a, a very recent video where he was staying with Mrs. Lockpicking Lawyer at a hotel and their door to their room was a one of those double doors or it might, I don't know if it was their room or like just into the private section of the hotel, but there was a double door thing and they didn't have the the extra little safety catch properly caught. And so all you had to do was stick basically any stiff piece of paper, which included the do not disturb sign in between, and it would just automatically unlock the door because the little safety catch there, which by the way, if, you, if you're not familiar, that little, little, that little thing that's on the door, uh, the door latch that, that like, you know, what is that for? That tiny little thing that everybody thinks is maybe just a spacer or something. It's not a spacer and it's not supposed to be spaced. It's not supposed to be, you're not supposed to give space for that. You need to make sure that your latch catches and not that spacer, not, not a spacer, and not that safety latch, because that safety latch is what prevents you from flipping the, the from pulling the thing open with a little piece of metal or a hook or something. So that's very important. Um, so basically, they asked Mr. Bruner to do all of that in the bathroom. They asked him to try and slip the latch, and he cut his hand with a fly swatter. That was negligent, in my humble opinion. The employees should not be doing that. They should be calling a professional. So, also, kudos to Mr. Bruner for maintaining his cool while he was in there. I, 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 I'm not a person who likes to be trapped places, and yeah. if I was trapped in a bathroom, I might be having panic attacks, and who knows? I, I'm not saying there'd be a weapon involved, but I might very well be trying to get out of that bathroom any way I know how. Oh, yeah, I definitely won't have the calm to think like, oh yeah, let's just call the employees here and get them to call, get it out. I'd probably be the one that'd be shouting and screaming and banging the door. Yeah, I, I'm finding I'm, a window I can fit I, through I, I and might, embarrass myself. Yeah, I might be breaking something and, and explaining later why I broke it and not asking for help. <laughs> Um, that's not a, that's, that's a thing I have to work on. That's not something for me to brag about. I, I was trapped with a, an abusive, um, choir director many years ago, and it has left a quite a formidable impression on me. I do not like to even be in a crowd of people. I, I, I start to feel trapped and a little panicky. So yeah, we don't like to be trapped. If Burger King refuses to honor its agreement with Mr. Bruner, if Burger King's attorneys later argue that it's unenforceable, Mr. Bruner intends to seek compensation for his injuries. So basically, he's saying, if you aren't going to honor the agreement, then here, I want to be paid for my hour of humiliation and injury in the bathroom. And frankly, I don't see where they're asking for the exact amount of money for that. It could be much higher yeah. than the, the Burgers for Life. And it sounds like this is a very reasonable uh, uh, request here. So just to finish it, he says, at all times relevant, the defendant Burger King operated at that location was uh, it had a duty to maintain its premises in a safe and suitable condition for its customers. Prior to that time, Burger King's bathroom door showed signs of damage caused by other people who had previously been locked inside the bathroom, establishing that Burger King knew and should have known that its bathroom door lock was not safe for su uh, or suitable for use by its customers. The knew or should have known language might have something to do with gross negligence. You can argue a higher level or, or, or a, a greater duty of care when you are aware of the problem. So if they were aware of the problem and did not take steps to fix it, that could have them liable for not just negligence, but gross negligence. However, it looks like they're only pleading negligence here. Mm. <clears throat> could be amended later if they don't want to settle up. Well, they can just set it up so they can add it in. As alleged in the complaint, Burger King was negligent in failing to exercise reasonable care by failing to maintain its premises in a safe and suitable condition. Mr. Bruner was harmed as a result for well over an hour. Mr. Injury, Mr. Bruner's injuries, Mr. Injuries, <laughs> Mr. Bruner's injuries were due in whole or in part to the acts and omissions of Burger King. They were negligent in one of the following respects: failing to maintain a reasonably prudent restaurant, failing to maintain its bathroom in a safe and suitable condition failing to timely and safely assist Mr. Bruner in exiting the bathroom. As a result, Burger King's negligent acts and omissions, as alleged in this complaint, Mr. Bruner experienced injuries, all of which were reasonable, reasonably foreseeable. Pain caused by a cut in his hand, discomfort caused by being physically confined in a Burger King bathroom, 
a, probably not the cleanest bathroom in the world. Yeah. Embarrassment caused by being laughed at while confined. And I'm assuming as he's being left out, uh, let out, I'm assuming people were laughing too. Yeah. I, I, I'm not saying I wouldn't laugh. It's kind of funny. I, I would also feel bad for the guy. Yeah. But the situation is objectively funny. Um, if Burger King refuses to honor its settlement, then Mr. Bruner intends to request fair compensation for the harm, not to exceed $9,026.16. So he's asking for a very reasonable amount of money. Yeah. And then his attorney says that they request reimburse costs, disbursements, maximum pre- and post-judgment interest, and any other relief the court may deem necessary in addition to the relief sought in paragraphs 3 to 5. So I thought that was a very, very, very reasonable request on behalf of Mr. Bruner and his attorney. That doesn't seem like they're looking for a payday at all. It just looks like they're looking for the agreement that was originally agreed to. And I don't see any reason why he shouldn't get it. Think of it this way. If Burger King hands him $9,026.16, they are doing themselves a disservice because their product is cheap and they have high profit margins. So it will cost them probably only $2,000 of burgers and employee time. And that's without factoring in any risk that Mr. Bruner might not go to the restaurant and get a burger every week. Mm -hmm. or, or he might not become 72. He might not become 72 while still exercising the agreement. Mm -hmm. So it's fully possible that Mr. Bruner's like Burger King's exposure to the original agreement is only a couple thousand dollars and not the nine thousand yeah. dollars. Yeah, just give him gift like, cards. Like bring a friend with him mm -hmm. and then friend doesn't get a free burger so like the friend spends more money there so yeah, yeah. the free burger is definitely a better call in yeah. my opinion so it would be quite stupid on on burger king's part if they didn't honor the agreement in full yeah I, I honestly i would even recommend that they that they don't even like modify the agreement and try to get it to be only one per week one uh, they should really honor the free wheel free meals for life even if he gets more than one per week yeah yeah but Honestly, even if it's just that, it's it's this really stupid decision of them to not pay, to not, not give him the benefit of the agreement they made. On that note, our $50 plus supporters for the month of January are Jonathan Doe, John Steele, Gavin Barnard, Evie, Andy, Kyle Mudrock, Vera Mintain, Michael Pierce, Terry Crisp, Richard Fournier, Spirit Bear, Jan de Grey, and Daniel Perez. Thank you very much for your support. Now, I know there are one or two of you who have contacted us for uh, support outside of Patreon, so you won't be on that $50 list if you're a $50 supporter. I deeply apologize that I don't have you on that list yet. I'm also not sure that there were any $50 plus supporters on that list yet. So I, if I, I will correct that as soon as I get back to the States and as soon as I have a chance to figure that all out. Uh, for now, the $5 plus supporters will be put on a crawl as well that, uh, that will be edited into the video like normal. I don't have a Patreon panel or, or, or LED panel for you at this time. We will get back to that all when I get back to the States to my studio there. And we also plan on making some changes to that studio. The studio has been very cluttered for a year. Basically, every time we do a story or I do a technology thing or whatever, I just put the thing up on the, on the thing. And now it's full. Now, how cool is that, though? We have a full studio background that is so full it needs to be pared down. So we're going to make it look more pretty, more watchable, um, a little less cluttered. Still Leonard. Still Leonard French. Not somebody else's version of what, what I want to do. Um, but maybe we'll even have a live stream of, like, going over everything that's on the, on, the, on the wall and then taking it down one at a time and then putting it back up. It's going to take hours, yeah. but we could do a stream on that. So... Thank you very much for your support. Thank you very much for joining me. We love you all. Your support is is invaluable to us, really. Uh, it, it, we, we use your money in, in ways to enrich the channel. And any little bit of enrichment that we get on the side it is... I try not to spend your money directly on something on me that's unrelated. I don't go buy myself a new car or whatever. You're not going to see that. I will drive my car into the ground or until it's economically sound to sell it and get another used car or something because I want to see this succeed. So I'm, I just want you to know that your support is greatly appreciated and used for you know the purposes that I've stated. So thank you very much for joining me. I'm Leonard Trench, your favorite copyright attorney, and I will see you in the videos that drop and in our next live stream. Love you all.